Death Holler is a horror cast created by two true horror fans to bring to the table Death your Holler. favorite horror films. The the topics details. include, but are not limited to, historical horror, gore, the occult, and terror. Listener discretion is advised. All right, so I recently uh, went to Halloween Horror Nights. I, I think you were aware of this. We talked about this offline, Urena. Um I have, um, I, 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 re- I went to it a couple years now. Um, we went to the one in 2019. Of course, they didn't have one in 2020 because of COVID. Uh, 2019 was a really good year. It was our first year there. We saw, uh, you know, a lot of houses that we enjoyed. Um, in particular, that year with Ghostbusters and um, Killer Clowns from Outer Space that, that I really enjoyed. Uh, Ugh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> The, and this year uh, was uh, actually a standout year for another reason. Like they had some good IP houses at HHN. This is in Orlando that that we went to. Um, they had some good houses at this one, but they were the the better ones in my opinion. Typically, or were actually the original houses, like the ones that were not IP. Uh, they were just something that they created for the year. And um, the one the one IP that stood out for me the best. And I've, I've got a ranking here of which ones I like the most. But the one that stood out as far as IPs was The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, if, if you, yeah, I'm excited for that one. If you And the one that you, that they have out in uh, California looks like it, it's got a couple of things that are really neat that's different, which they always make different things between the two uh, theme parks, uh, different universals. But the one that in Hollywood's got a neat scene where they've got Nell... Uh, like the ghost bent neck lady version of her floating over her childlike body in one of the scenes you can see. And the way they did the effect out in California looks pretty cool that way. They didn't do it in uh, in Orlando that way. It was more like you're walking down a dark hallway and they've got like this transparent material with nail uh, of the bent neck lady up above you. And then like it flashes as you walk underneath and you see her over top of you is how they did in Orlando, which I thought was kind of neat. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. N- yeah, the fact that they have different aspects of it to view... Yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna have some interesting uh, comparisons to make. <laughs> but um, the one that stood out the most, I, I mean, I've got a, a personal ranking of all of them. But I mean, and Beetlejuice was one of them, but it was more toward like the middle bottom of my list, just because it's one of those houses. It's more about like you're literally walking through the movie. It's not scary. Beetlejuice itself is not scary, but like they played up like you know a lot of the the, the fun parts of the movie. And they and one thing I liked about that house was they had like this guy dressed up as Beetlejuice who was a live actor who was actually interacting with you as you walked into the house because it was like this ramp design that they had built to like go up into like the ghost tunnel. And as you were walking up through there, Beetlejuice was up there basically heckling the audience as they came in. It's like, you know, what do I got to do to get a, (laughs) you know, to get a laugh out of you guys? You know, that sort of thing. Like, you know, and he did a really good job. So that was cool. But uh, the house itself was only so-so for the scares and the theme and everything. The one that stood out the most, and it's one I'm going to bring up other than Hill House, is Wicked Growth. This was their traditional Halloween house. Like, everything Halloween that you can think of was thrown in this house. You go into the, the outside of it, and it's like this big tunnel made out of the, that's like circular in design that's like full of pumpkins. And especially at night, they're lit yes. up, you know, like, you know, the lit up jack and lanterns. So that gets you in the mood immediately. And then you've got this witch. Uh, whose play, whose voice is playing as you're walking in, and she's talking about summoning the pumpkin lord, and how she's got these different ingredients to summon him. It's like fear, and you know, death, and you know, all this other stuff, and like you know, it gets you set up for the house. And the neat, this house was just neat all the way through. They had like, um, they 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 start out with a scene where you're going like this old like timey, uh, you know, like. Uh, uh, you know, household or whatever that you'd find in like some kind of frontier setting or something. And like the, there was a guy on a table and like these small pumpkins had burst through out of his chest and were growing out into the room. And like the whole room was covered in vines. And it's like the, the pumpkin Lord is like, you know, like he's the, the seeds of the pumpkins are like using people to like spread just kind of what they're hinting at. And there's like this radio announcement as you're walking through about how like there's a bunch of people that are scared about like, and that's where the fear parts of it comes in from her ingredients. You know, they're scared about what, you know, all the deaths that are happening. And, uh, you go through a cemetery at one scene, you go through the witches, uh, in the witch's actual hut. And one of the cool things in the background is that they've got like a little, it looks like a little girl, like in a cage, like, you know, like Gretel is like, you know, back there getting ready to be eat or something. Uh, and, um, 
And there's a and there's also a scene. And the, the end part of it's the best because you start walking through these tunnels and they're basically you're inside of a giant pumpkin and the pumpkin guts are all around you. And you get to the end scene and there's a pumpkin lord and he's above you and like you're basically he's he's uh, grabbing whatever you know uh, he's got these tentacles that have came out of his pumpkin and he's grabbing whoever comes close to him and ripping them apart and like feasting upon them to grow and that, he's the one that brings Halloween is the theme of it and it I just the whole design was neat I just loved it. Yeah, I mean, I saw the pictures. I don't know if they have that at my Universal. At least I haven't, you know, researched yet because I'm obviously out in the Universal Hollywood is the one I'll be attending. So I saw these and I'm like, okay, I can't wait. I've seen his photos. I can't wait to kind of get my own and see if I have the same houses. That'll be, to me, that'll be even cooler because we'll be able to say, oh, I saw this, I saw this, you know, and kind of compare how similar or different they are. I, the I don't know that you'll get that house, unfortunately, just because that is one of the houses that Orlando itself specifically did. I think that Hollywood maybe went different routes with the way they because they've got more themed things out or more IP based things out in Hollywood this year. They've got The Exorcist, um, they've got The Purge, uh, which Orlando doesn't have either one of those. And I want to say maybe you all have Michael Myers, a Halloween one, two or something. This yes, year. we do have a Halloween. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I'm going through. Oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Apparently we, we had that in Orlando and that one was neat. There was one scene in the in, in the, the house where they were pumped because they pump incense, which, you know, helps like bring you into the, you know, the theme of the, the house you're walking through. Wicked Growth was cool because when you walk into the, the, the entrance to it, you've got like this fall leaf like you know dead leaves like you know um, it just had a real autumn smell to it like you know when you walk into the place and then whenever you get into the witch's part of the or the witch's hut it was like a cinnamon smell like, like that was what they were pumping through oh yeah i really like that the uh the texas chainsaw mask house was the worst for going through because there's a scene where you go out back behind the the where the where they have their restaurant that they've been cooking people in and there's all these dead hogs and stuff that they've cut up and it's and they pump in a smell that smells like barbecue and dead meat. And boy did it smell like what they said it smelled like. It was nasty. <laughs> so good luck with that when you get to it. No, that is uh uh <laughs> Which one was this again? Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was the worst no, smell. No, fuck that. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Um, I'm gonna tell you. Um one year we went, it was a couple of years ago, I want to say 2018, and it wasn't during Halloween, but they still had the uh, Walking Dead walkthrough. And I've mentioned that I didn't really keep my eyes open. I actually used my six-year-old's hands to cover my eyes. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, he walked out of that house crying his eyes off. But from what I did see... It was scary because they had like areas where the zombies, um, they're just about to break through the gate and somehow they work it out in time to where they get them back into this area, get it closed off so that when people are walking through, as your group is walking past them, it, they do break through and you have to start booking it. You know, because they're chasing you and it feels so real. And that's the one thing I love about Universal Studios is they are so good at making it look and feel real. Their their production design is just remarkable. That That's the thing that I love about their haunted houses. They, like this year due to COVID and they had some of the uh, vinyl plastic sheets up in places, uh, you know, and, and, and like to keep, you know, their scare actors away from people in case of COVID or whatever probably overkill but you know whatever it's it's their decision to do that it did give some of the scares away because you saw the sheets and you knew somebody was going to pop out from behind them but the production design was still phenomenal that's that's the reason i like going because i mean it's movie quality props they put into these houses i mean like it it looks like you're going through maybe not a high budget you know movie but sometimes it even feels high budget but definitely like middle of the you know like middle of the road budget like horror movies where the you know the you don't you don't really have janky effects or anything you kind of get that from their houses like they put that much effort into them uh, <laughs> um god i just hearing all of this and you know me i love spoilers i don't think i'm gonna get spoilers but i just i can't wait till i go 
I, I want to hear your thoughts on your all's version of it because, like, I, we we loved the one that we had down there. There was only one house, and that was uh, the Tooth Fairy that we thought was just kind of dull because the I mean they had too much plastic up and it kind of ruined everything. But the rest of the houses, there was always something that that they they did this neat little thing they did in there that was really stood out. And I, I mean, I um. Even like there, there's uh, Welcome to Scary Horror in the Heartland or something. Uh, there was a scene where you're just basically walking through like this this town or whatever that's like supposed to be in like in Ohio, and uh, it's and there's like a scene where you go through a butcher shop and they have like this character uh, who's the mascot of the butcher shop called Meaty Meats and like he's got like this big oh yeah. I love that scene because he's got like this big like head, you know, like a uh, mascot head on that kind of looks like the Fallout, you know, boy or whatever from like the Fallout games. And, you know, yes. and he kind of pops up and he's got this good voice like, hey, kids, you know, like, but he's got this butcher knife in his hand whenever he says it. And the way he pops out, and it's just great. I, I loved every bit of it. I can't wait to go. If I'm going to be very honest with you, I am the most excited. Me personally, I am the most excited for, um, the Purge Terra Tram. And it looks like, because we have the, and I don't, I sound stupid, I should know this, but I've never been to Universal Orlando. Do they have the tram that kind of takes you through the studios and they, shows you different things? They don't. You, you, you get in a lot of, uh, you, you have to walk a lot down at Universal Orlando because you have to walk to everything and, their houses, Beetlejuice and Hill House were the ones they had there this year. Those houses that are in that part of the park down below the kids zone area are a mile out and a mile back. And by the time you're done with the night, I, I, there was one day where I did a little bit in the parks and then I came back at night and I did HHN. I had 30,000 steps on my pedometer by the time that the, the night was done. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> it is a lot of walking down in Orlando just because you have to go to everything. But... Uh, so yeah, they, they, uh, I think the reason we have the tram is because they still do filming at Universal Studios. There's a back lot where all the – there's still shows that are filmed and everything. So you actually get to – they don't want people walking back there, obviously, because it's legit studios. So they drive you back there and they show you, you know, this is filmed on this day. This is filmed on this day. This is – you know, these are the studios for these films. So they show you that. But I know there's a specific area they can block off. And I think they're actually, the terror tram is going to, quotation mark, break down. And I think you get to kind of walk through it. When I saw the video, that's the impression I got. I could be wrong. So I'll definitely be reporting back on that. Because I'm kind of excited to walk through the purge, if you will. That would be neat. Like, it, you kind of going along the tram and, like, doing your thing. And all of a sudden, it's, like, just breaks down. And I, we, we got to get off here, guys. And, like, then, then you get the purge effect going on. That would be neat. Yeah. So I, if I get to do that, I'm going to be so excited. I'm going to like it anyways, but I'll be keeping you abreast of that. Well, I think with that, uh, here's somebody at the door. So uh, cue the music. Cueing the music. Hello and welcome back to Death Holler. I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. Death, and joining me from the realm of eternal night, Unicorn Slayer herself, La Urena. How fair the Urena? I do not slay unicorns. Take it back. <laughs> Just children. Just, okay, I'm sorry. I, I was a little bit mistaken on that. Um, Get it right. <laughs> Uh, if anybody, if you didn't know, uh, today we're discussing the 1985 cult classic Legend, and I have to say the 1985 version because there is another movie apparently with uh, Tom Hardy in it called Legend. That's uh, more recent, a uh, completely different movie, by the way. But anyways, uh, wait, is that not what we were watching? Because that's what I watched. Well, I feel so Tom Hardy. Well, I feel sorry for you then. I mean, it's supposed to be a good movie, but that's not what we're talking about. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, but this one's. It's it's a lot off the beaten path. I mean, this doesn't seem like a movie that we would discuss on a horror podcast because it really isn't a horror movie, but it is a very very dark fantasy film. Like there are definitely horror themes in this mo in this movie, 
And you combine that with the uh, the fact that it's got narrative echoes with like you know part of the the Christian Bible, and um, and one of the most impressive physical representations of the devil ever put the film. I felt like it. Oh my god, yes! I, I felt like it definitely needed to be included in this season. You know, considering what we're discussing. Probably one of the best devils we've seen thus far, and one of the least scariest versions of. <laughs> You know, not I wouldn't say he's a less scary version of the devil, but less scarier films that we've watched. Right. I mean, and and we'll get into that why they went the route they did with it, you know, when we discussed the film, but I you can't think of a devil in a film without thinking of Tim Curry's darkness. It's just too iconic. Yeah, the darkness. I thought it was funny how they called him the darkness and like, can we just call him the devil? Oh wait, wait, wait. He had another name in the film too. I believe it was Big D. Did you not catch that? I did not catch that, no. Oh, my God. It was when one of the characters, I mean, we'll get into it, but one of the characters, like, has the unicorn, uh, you know, horn, and he's like, I'm the new ruler now. Your reign is over. And then one of the other guys is like, shh, the big D is behind you. And oh, okay, I, like, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah, one of those, like, the little goblin guys. I got gotcha. you, yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was, you know me, I chuckled like a little freaking <laughs> teenager. Um. Well, before we move on, just a bit of a podcast business. Uh, we are on all the major podcasting platforms, as we've discussed previously. And if if you could, just give us a like, subscribe, uh, 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 comment. We would appreciate it. That kind of gets our uh, boost our numbers up, so maybe we, more people can get you know access and 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 see the show. Uh, if we, I mean. Apparently, was it Sweden is doing their their thing, so they're they're doing their job. We just need everybody else to kind of you know help us out a little bit, and and uh, we would greatly appreciate it because the the more people yeah. uh, you know tune into the show, the more we can do with the show because we we can we've got a lot of stuff we'd like to do with it. But you know we we yeah need... spread the word, man. Talk <laughs> about us. Tell your friends. You know you know some people. Even tell, if you're embarrassed of us, we're, we apologize, but <laughs> tell your neighbors, get the look show at you, out there. Tell your neighbors, they'll look at you weird for a while and wonder why the hell you listen to such a thing. But it's cool. I mean, you know, you don't have to, yeah. you don't have to be friends with them anyways. Um, if nothing else, our audio is amazing compared to what's out there. <laughs> Humble brag. Yeah. Somebody, uh, hint, hint, does a lot of, uh, work editing and making sure this thing sounds great. So, uh. Urena definitely needs the, the some thumbs up somewhere for that. Uh, so kudos. For oh my God. I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking in general how <laughs> some people sound like they're just recording straight from their computer microphone. Oh, you don't? <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, whoopsie. You know what, though? Seriously, um, I have heard of a certain podcast where the audio, it's kind of unfortunate because the audio is not the greatest, but oh my God, some of the best conversations. So. Really, I try to not let that affect how, you know, I listen. I try not to let that affect how I listen to a podcast or if I, I'm listening. So, yeah. But we appreciate it. And uh, uh, just, you know, if you can get it out there, you know, and, and get the word out there for us, we, we'd be really appreciative of it. Um, yes. Moving appreciate on. It. Appreciate it. Appreciated. Uh, moving <laughs> on. That's, that's, that's sadly close to how I say that when I shared that meme to you. But anyways. I know. <laughs> Uh, moving on. So we've, we discussed HHN a little bit. I'm going to move on from that. I have been watching some films. Uh, it is spooky season, so I've got a lot to talk Wait, about. Wait, you watching horror films? Yeah, it never happens. I, I, you know, I, occasionally, you know, I, I like to pop one in there and, you know, but uh, they're not really my cup of tea. I don't really care for them that much, but no, mm -hmm. I've, I've been watching a ton of them for a spooky season. Um, and I'm going to start out with Netflix uh, because uh, I've watched several things on there recently. Uh, one of the things, there's a new movie that came out, I don't know how recently, but it's it's just recently popped up on my like recommended list called Notebooks. Have you heard of this one, Urena? Not at all. This is a... And I'm not being sarcastic. <laughs> no, no, it's it's fine. It this is not a horror film. It, it's 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 almost like a dark fantasy again. It's almost like a legend type film. But it's very new. It's came out in 2021. I think Kristen Ritter is the uh, the main baddie in this. She's the the witch that's in this movie, and it's uh it's basically um it's it's 
the setup is there's a the young boy, a uh, kind of a nerdy looking kid who's all obsessed with horror stuff. Like he's 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 got horror posters on his wall that he should have never watched. I'll just put it that way. He's too young to have seen half the movies that's on his wall, but that's cool. They're good movies. Whoever, you know, put the posters up, they've got good taste. But he's all about horror stuff and he's got and his for his birthday he he his parents put together a little haunted house for him. Unfortunately, nobody shows up. And it, and, and it devastates the kid because his best friend, the only friend he's got, uh, kind of bugged out on him because the popular kids convinced him it was too nerdy to hang out with him. And so they went and did other things. So the kid decides that he's going he, and he writes horror stories. He's got these night books is what he calls them. That's you know, hence the title. And he decides that he's going to tear them all up. And he's going and he's and he in the process, he decides he's going to run away. He's just fed up. Nobody cares about him. His parents are kind of just half there. And so, they're, I mean, they, they try to understand him, but he's kind of a weird kid because he's into horror films, apparently. And so, and they don't connect with that. So, he leaves. He's walking down the, uh, in the apartment building is at a few uh, rooms down when one of the doors is opened in one of the rooms. And he happens to walk inside of it. And there's this TV screen playing like a horror film. I don't remember which one it was now. And there's a slice of pumpkin pie there on the table. Well, he walks up and, you know, looks around and... A good hint to everybody, you know, if you're a space for a kid, don't just eat random food that's laying around. That's probably not the best thing for you because in this movie, <laughs> it, it, it was drugged. So, and he wakes up the next morning and uh, Kristen Ritter, who played um, uh, Jessica Jones, that's what most people remember her from, the, you know, in the Netflix series, uh, Marvel series. She is uh, this fairly attractive witch, actually. She dresses up pretty well in this and... uh and she is basically like this dominatrix type, you know, character, at least in attitude, because she does, doesn't give two shits about anybody. It's all about herself. And she and she tells this poor kid, like, I need a story every night. You're going to write it for me. And if you don't, I'll kill you. And then she just kind of leaves him to this thing and says, I'll see you tonight. And you better have something written for me. And that's basically the, the, how the movie starts out. And, and he finds out there's another little girl there. Uh, who's also trapped by the witch, and but and she's being made mainly used as like a maid or something like that because the witch just refuses to do anything for herself and like she keeps these kids for as long as they're useful and then she gets more kids in whenever she kills them and they're not worth anything to her anymore. And every night this kid has to come up with a story, but he doesn't like write any new stories. Is basically the gist of it. Like he keeps going to his books. Because he's already got a ton of stories written. He doesn't have to come up with anything. He's trying to figure out where he's at and what's happening. And through the course of the film, like, eventually he's forced to reveal, like, because, uh, like, it doesn't reveal at the start of the movie that that's why he's giving up the night books. But he has to give that secret up eventually, you know, to the witch. Because she, she wants his pain out there. Because there's a, there's a reason why she needs the pain to feed off of. But the whole movie basically plays out like this, uh... Like almost like that raw doll, or raw doll, however his name said, you know, the one that made a, uh, you know, Willy oh, Wonka. Oh, raw doll, yeah. yeah. He made a, a, you know, in addition to uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, he made like The Witches, which is also a Netflix film. This movie feels like a modern version of that because you've got these kids trapped in this witch's apartment that changes in size and all this sort of thing. She's, uh, she's got, she has them harvesting this weird mist that she or that she uses to, they think to keep her young, but there's other uses for it later on. And it's, it's more of like a dark fantasy film. Cause it's, it's like a new take on Hansel and Gretel. If you want to think of it that way, they literally reference Hansel yeah. and Gretel in the movie. Um, I mean, when you were first describing it, I was kind of thinking like misery, you know, she, with Kathy Bates, how well, she had this kid writing, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not far from that either, but I mean, it's kind of a, a oh, mix, okay. but I mean, it's, it's interesting because I mean it, it's it, the characters are you know the kids are cute they you know they uh, they play their parts well I mean anytime you deal with child actors I mean it can be hit or miss but these kids do their part well uh, Kristen Ritter's just eating up the scenes you know like she's really digging this witch that's just a total you know bitch to everybody that you know and what are you gonna do for me today if you don't I'll kill you ta ta type thing and um, I don't know. It, it was, I would give it a ranking of like three and a half out of five and maybe go up from there. If I was to rewatch it, I actually enjoyed it for what it was. Um, not bad. This is probably something we've both seen squid game. Um, I, yes, that's the one I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 
you could classify this as horror, I would think. It's close. It's torture porn, if nothing else. It's it's on the verge. Oh, yes. It's got gore in it. It is... Uh, you know what, though? It's not super scary, but I guess when it gets into... When it finally gets into the action, and you know how I'm always looking for major action in films, um, it, it gets gory, and it gets gory fast, and I love it. I... I really, this movie for me didn't click until the red light, green light scene. And I think that's what it's going to be for most people. When you see that scene and you see what the, what this movie's really about, you're like, oh shit, I'm in for this ride. Um, the gore in it's out there. It's really crazy. The funny thing is, and I've said this to you like off air, but I really, this reminds me a lot of Sweet Home. And I know you've seen that, or at least I've heard you talk about it before. Uh, Sweet Home is another Netflix uh, Korean-based show, uh, almost like an anime, and I think it was based upon anime actually. But like, it's this apartment building of these uh, these people that don't really know each other, and through the action, just like they don't Squid Game because they're all kind of thrown into this game together. But like, mm-hmm. they, they start getting attacked by these mutated monsters. There's been like some kind of virus that's been released over the over the town, and people are mutating into these horrific monsters that look like something out of Resident Evil. And, you know, it, it's got a lot of the same vibes as this because you got the scenes where you got the intense gore, the, the horror, you know, like which there's more of in Sweet Home because it's monsters. But um, and then you've got the scenes in between where you get the characters actually revealing their backstories to each other. And that's kind of the, that's where I'm coming from when I say they're similar. You've got like the, the gist of the show, like we're in this one. It's they're all locked into this game where they're having to get killed over kids games. But then in between, you're like, okay, what's that character's deal? The doctor, what? why did he come to this place? And then it re- slowly reveals his history. And it's like, okay, what about the old man? What about his history? Same thing with Sweet Home. It's like you've got all these different characters. And you only kind of, you start out with, just, just like in Squid Game, you start out with one character. And then you get to eventually know the other ones. And I, I feel like they've got that same kind of narrative arc to them. Like you get the horror, the development, the horror. And it kind of just breaks it up that way. Yeah, because in Squid Game, honestly, I would have just been like, who's going to win? If we had just gotten straight into, like, I know you're right. The It's hard to get invested until you get to red light, green light. But when it comes to, like, developing, wanting to see the show more, you want to see what happens to the character next, at least when it started, because you're following one person. And I know each episode you're going to get a little bit more from each character, but I think it helps invest you in the show a little more because then you start developing a, I want this person to win or I want this person to win or this person died and I didn't want that person to die or I feel so bad. You know, I think they're doing a really good job of building up the characters and making you kind of invest in general into the show, even though it was a slow burn for me at first. I was kind of bored at first, but then I, after I was- red light, green light, I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, I'm right there with you. I was bored up until, I mean, it didn't, did not click for me up until red light, green light. I was like, okay, this guy's a gambler. He's a deadbeat dad. He's not really, I mean, he's a shit person, you know? Okay. Okay. And then all of a sudden red light, green light. And all of a sudden the sniper rifles come out and I'm like, oh shit. Now I know what I'm getting into. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what would your, be your ranking on this one? Um, I'm just going to go off a of red light, green light or Yeah. Just go off a red light, green light right now, um, just because I haven't finished the show entirely. And so based off of that, and everyone's seen it, I'm going to give this one a five. I, I, I've, I've got to save my high rating for something else uh, that I'm going to discuss in okay. a second. This is definitely a four, maybe a four and a half upon a rewatch. Uh, I would... The, the wait till you get to the scene where they're crossing the glass bridge, and then you'll—I mean—that one's really tense. That that probably beats red light, green light because of how they they because they've got character development and they've got the the horror going on at the same time, or the tension at least. I've seen the scene, kind of. I didn't finish the scene, but my daughter finished the whole series, so I managed to catch it. And then I was like, okay, I need that was a scene that made me say I need to start watching this film, <laughs> or not film, sorry, series. But yeah, I would definitely put this at a four, four and a half. So we're right there. We're the top, top of the, the rankings on this. Uh, the one that I'm going to give my top rankings for, for at least a four and a half or a five, I'm just going to throw it out there first before I even get in the show is Midnight Mass. I oh my God. Love, I've been hearing so much about this. Love this series. Um, 
right off the bat, now this is a slow burn, uh, far more than Squid Game. So I'm going to warn you about that up front. You've got to be willing to develop, because this does the traditional Western way of, of dealing with characters. I love the way the Koreans are doing their thing where they give you the characters, you don't know anything about them, you get the horror, then you get some development on the ones that are left, and it kind of goes from there. I love that. That's a neat way to do it. This is full-on Western type, you know, story writing. You get the character development all up front, so you care about the characters you care about, and you hate the ones you hate, and then you get the stuff on the back end that just blows up, and, you know, you get the, the big reveals. That's how this is set up. So you've got to be willing to sit through at least two acts of development with a little bit of stuff going on in the background to kind of keep you interested, like, what the hell was that? What was that sound? You know, that type of thing. There's some weird shit going on. Until you get to the big reveal. And when it, and the big reveal is given by one character in particular. And whenever it starts rolling, it goes balls out. So just be aware of that. You've got to, you've got to give it the time it needs. Having said okay. that, this is the best non-Stephen King, Stephen King story I've ever seen put to any kind of film. It has elements of some of his best stories and I'm not talking, you know, I, I think I put this on a forum and somebody came back with a Shawshank meme. It's not Shawshank. It's not Green Mile. It's his classic supernatural stuff. The stuff that people really dig. And I don't want to say the one that it really reminds me of the most on here because it's probably going to give something away unless you want to get into, I mean, unless, you know, you want me to throw the spoiler out there and let, you know, and they can, you know, blank over it. It does throw in a little bit of Storm of the Century. I will say that because that doesn't have any reveal to the show at all. They're on a secluded island, and that's kind of the, where they're operating at. I mean, they can make it to the mainland through the use of one boat that's a ferry between the two of them. And that sets up later, you know, when the shit starts hitting the fan, that, that ties them to their place. They can't, it, it's, it creates the box that, that puts them in. So I like that part of it. And, it. and Stephen King did that with Storm of the Century. But it's got a lot of his old stuff where... Even like what we talked about, uh, and because this doesn't reveal anything, a lot of people have been comparing it to this, um, Needful Things. You've got the setup with the characters before the town blows up. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, where you get like all yeah. the individual like beefs between people. It does that. It, it like, it leads you into that. It gives you that Stephen King vibe. It's like, okay, there's the town drunk. He end up, you know, he hurt this little girl in, in a shooting accident and everybody hates his guts, but he's a dog lover. So they're, you know, he's not all bad. Uh, oh my know. god <laughs> you've got the uh the typical stephen king character the an evangelical uh hateful bitch uh mrs carmody i think was her name in um, uh, um the mist but the one that you know is the bit the, the the evangelical person that everybody hates because she's so high on her own holiness that she you know basically there's nothing christian about her like she takes christianity and like you know twist it that's a typical Stephen King thing where you got this person who's just like, they, they want to have a new, um, uh, you know, like crusade, basically. Like everybody's a heathen to them and they just want to, you know, lay waste to them for the Lord's work or whatever. You, you get that character in it. Uh, you get, uh, they throw in a neat twist where the sheriff of the town, the new sheriff of the town is actually a Muslim. And so they work because a lot of the show is about faith and it's, and a lot of the build up to it is about people's faith, what they believe in God, like, or if they don't like what happens in the afterlife. And there's a reason why they dwell on that stuff before the big reveal, because the supernatural creature that they bring into the mix actually blends well with that, that theme. So, uh, I, I mean, okay. That, and so you've got this Muslim character who's, you know, he's the only character in, in, he's the only person in town that has that religion. And you've got this, you know, and you've got this pull and tug, like his son's kind of interested in the, the local Catholic church because it's the only church there. But like, you know, it, he, he lost, you, you find out that he lost his wife at one point and his wife and the only thing that, that she, you know, that she held on to during all of her terrible suffering that she had with her cancer was her belief in Allah. So if her son you know, was to convert, that's like him basically pissing on their faith, you know, so there's like that twist and pull. There's a lot of that going on in the show. Um, and it's, and it just the interaction between the characters are interesting enough without, before the supernatural stuff hits. And when it does, they've done an excellent job of combining re Catholicism, especially with this one type of supernatural monster. And I, and I, I mean, I love it just outright. I, four and a half or five out of five. I mean, I, I could rewatch this and it would probably go up definitely to a five. Mm, can I throw out a wild guess? 
Uh, yeah, if you don't want to spoil it for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it would spoil it. You don't have to. You don't have to give it away. Okay. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Well, uh, spoiler alert for the next minute. What's what's your throw out here? Spoiler alert. Um, I have not read this anywhere or anything, but just listening to you, the thing that comes to my mind is Salem's Lot. It's exactly what it it is. Oh, <laughs> I've, now I have to watch the show. <laughs> so anyway, spoiler alert over. Um, it it definitely fits that particular movie you just mentioned. You know, uh, that's the one that it definitely reminded me of. I was like, oh my god, this is like the best version of that story that I've ever seen put to film. Um, and that was a really good storyline, especially for my people or people <laughs> like me. <laughs> um, but moving on from that. Um, uh, that's what I saw on Netflix. I didn't really catch anything on Shudder. I know we like to throw things out there to them. I tried watching last night because I sent the message to you, the uh, Joe Bob yes. uh, Halloween hoedown. The movie that he he let one of the uh, guys who directed um, Halloween Kills and, and the new ha and Halloween 2018, uh, he let that guy like pick a film for him. And, it, it, and it's supposed to be a Halloween episode, and they pick a film called uh, Angel, which is like this... It's got a serial killer in it, but it's basically like these, this young 15-year-old honor student who's also a prostitute, who's like on the Hollywood, like, you know, like uh, main strip or whatever, and all the weird characters that she's friends with, like there's a, a trans drag queen or a trans, you know, hooker that's there, uh, or a drag queen, however they want to define it. Uh there's an old cowboy that's past his prime that's like selling autographs. There's just, and it, nothing about it is horror themed at all, like really, other than the fact there's a serial killer killing these prostitutes. And it doesn't have a Halloween feel to it. So I was trying to watch it last night and I fell asleep. And I'm just like, mm, I hope the second movie, whenever they premiere it in like a couple of days, is actually something more Halloween themed. But that's the only thing I really tried to watch on Shudder. And I wasn't too impressed with that particular movie. It's called Angel, if, if I didn't throw that out there. Um, uh yeah you did it sounds like you were not really feeling this film it was it was good for the type of film it was don't get me wrong because i've seen i've watched a lot of shitty horror films i'm just gonna throw it out there to people this was not shitty in its delivery they actually the character development the way that they filmed it the, the you know the just the look of the film was quality and it and i've never heard of this film so that was neat but it's just like i don't get anything out of like these i don't know like almost uh, like it's like Maniac's one of them. It's like one of these, uh, like the human killers or whatever. That don't, they're just like twisted, you know, serial killers or something like that. I got to have a little bit of supernatural to really get into a film to really like it a lot. And I, I just, I mean, I, I can deal with some of the, you know, the the basic like you know stories about Ed Gein and some of that stuff because they're they're interesting yeah. from that perspective. But if it's a made up serial killer, that's I don't know. I just I, it, it didn't. It's uh, yeah. It's not that r <laughs> the reality is not scary. It is scary, but something about supernatural. It's what's not what you think is not possible becoming possible. That freaks me the fuck out. Yeah, I mean, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Te technically, is what exactly what I'm talking about. I don't like. I mean, I love that film. And I guess even, well, Michael Myers is until the end of his film in the original Halloween. He's basically just a serial killer. But there's something about that setup that's a little bit more interesting to me because, like, you don't know those characters. There's something, you know, unknown, unknowable about them. This movie actually has you have scenes with the serial killer in between his kills. And, like, you see how fucked up he is. Like, you know, it's kind of like he's got these weird, like, body issues. Like, he's all the time working out. And, like, he's got this weird scene where he's sucking on an egg sexually and like pops it in his mouth whenever and it's just like and he's making love to the dead hookers too so he's got necrophilia going on and it's just oh, like great. And, and you're just seeing these scenes and it, i don't know you you put a there's since you're so in his eyes or whatever like through part of the film like i don't know it takes all the mystique out of it and any horror that you might get from him as a character just kind of goes away from me i don't i don't know how to describe it other than that it's just it takes the mystique away from it a little bit and I don't really, I mean, like I said, I don't get much out of those ones that are just like made up serial killers that they threw in movies to, you know, I mean, that don't have anything like that. At least like with Norman Bates, like you're like, what the fuck is going on upstairs in his house? Like, why does he keep talking to his mom? Like in his head, you know, there's something to kind of drive you a little bit with his character. This guy is just some weird sight, you know, weird looking dude that just goes around trying to pick up hookers and kills them. Like, I, I don't know. It just didn't do anything for me that way. Well, that's kind of a shame for it. Is this, is this like his first like no, episode or special on Shutter? No, he's had a ton. It's just, I, and 
what everybody was really hoping for is for years, Darcy, the male girl, uh, kinky horror is what she goes by on, online. Uh, Diana Prince, Prince, I think is what her, you know, she goes by as her handle. Uh, she has argued for years that they should do Halloween three and I would love it. I mean, cause they can't get like the high dollar Halloween movies. Like that's, they even tried for this one cause they, they've got both Jason Blum from Blumhouse who made the new Halloween movies and the guy who directed them. And they still couldn't get the rights to either one of the new films because of the fact that a, they wouldn't give them out the new one regardless because they want people to go see it, but they wouldn't even give them 28. Yeah. They wouldn't give them Halloween 2018 because universal had already lent out the rights to other networks. So, it was like, it, I feel like, I mean, the fact that that guy who directed that, I mean, this might have been a movie that inspired him to do films, and that's fine. And and, and Darcy and, and Joe Bob both love Angel for what it is, but I just don't feel like, I mean, for a Halloween episode, you think you're getting something a little bit spookier with it. I mean, he's done some, sh yeah. he's done some shitty, because he had to, uh, Halloween-themed films, but at least they had the theme to them, like Hack O' Lantern and... Uh, I think there was like, <laughs> yeah, and that, that movie's terrible. But anyways, like, there, he's done some stuff like that, but at least they were based around Halloween. Like, this has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, well, that's sad. Yeah, uh, it is. I, I was really disappointed with it. Uh, as far as Hulu goes, uh, you can chime in on this. What we do in the shadows, it's not quite over yet, but <laughs> I've, I've, I've been loving that, uh, especially the last episode I saw which I haven't seen the one this week, but the last episode I saw was where the sire escapes from their, uh, their, from his internment or whatever. And like, you get to see the return of the Baron and his little pink car, which I don't know if you caught this reference. Did you get that that was from gremlins that they were imitating in that scene? No, not at all. Uh, it reminded me of that cause you know, and get, you even mentioned it to me and I was like, okay, <laughs> did I miss this or something in gremlins? What am I lacking right it, now? It's at the end of gremlins where Gizmo was flying around the little department store in the pink car, the little pink Cadillac that he's driving around in. And when the Baron rolls in and his version of it, I was like, oh my God, that's so cute that they, they made him ride around in a car just like Gizmo. Uh, oh my God. And and then you and they even had the scene with the sire. The sire kind of looked like one of the the gremlins themselves, so it kind of fit the the whole image. Uh, but I don't. I've got to say, in this new season, the first couple episodes didn't really get me back in. Like I mean, because season two ended on such a high that when season three came out and they were dealing with the council stuff, like for the first couple episodes, I was like, oh man, I, am I losing interest in this show? And then they find, and I think it's whenever they got to the episode where they go to Atlantic City that really brought me back in. I'm like. They're back. They they they've got me. Um, so I don't know how you felt about it. I don't know if that's the, kind of what you were coming. I mean, if that's how you felt about this new season, or if you've been invested the whole time. I mean, that's kind of where I was at with it. No, I have about two episodes I need to catch up on, but I will say that, <laughs> much like middle of nowhere, I've been chuckling the whole time. <laughs> the, with the first two episodes, they did not bother me. I didn't have any qualms against them. A little cheesy. But I kind of expect that from this show because it's kind of horror cheesy comedy and I get a huge kick out of that for some reason. So I've been entertained, whereas you're like, okay, come on, let's get to some good storyline, which I do appreciate from this show. I'm not going to pretend that I don't. So I got a little catching up. You're definitely ahead of me right now. So okay. I didn't catch the, but you told me and I don't, you know me, I don't, spoilers don't bother me. I, I love spoilers. So. <laughs> Um, it's not going to prevent me from watching it. So have you watched the new American Horror Story? No. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's mini rant. It's just that really, I want to say, I don't know if it was election, the election season. Oh, the election or if it season was, was awful. Awful. Yeah, I know that one was horrible. I could not get into, was it 1984? Was that the... I don't know how you didn't. You, you, and you said that was a good one. It's great. Like you, you get like, you know, part way into it and it's just so out there crazy. You've got a satanic serial killer who's actually got satanic powers. You've got a camp where if where some people die there, it just like murder house, their spirits always stay there. Uh, you've got like a, a evil, uh, like a previous serial killer who's played by, you know, um, uh, John Carroll, I believe his name is. He's he's a ser series regular. He was the one that played like the freaky clown on the the freak show version or whatever. Um, yeah, he he's another serial killer that that's come back to the property. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's got like, I mean, it's got everything in it. You've got, I mean, it's just it, it, they couldn't have thrown anything more. They got ghosts. They've got you know killers. 
the nineteen eighties camp thing going on, you know, like Jason and that sort of thing. It's just it all combined together. I'm like, I love this. I love everything about it. I did not like Roanoke. I couldn't even. <laughs> oh yeah, I was about to say I couldn't get into Roanoke. And my husband swears up and down that's one of the best seasons. I'm like, mm-hmm, you were just looking at Lady Gaga's bits and pieces. So <laughs> I don't believe you. Uh, they say that uh, Hotel was a good one. I need to go back and rewatch that because I only got like two episodes in. I believe on that one. I did like Hotel. But I did not like election. I'm like, you guys couldn't have took this whole Trump thing, you know, and made it into something any better than what you, I was just like, oh, my God, uh, I'm so over this. And I and I, I refuse. Was that season called election or was it cult or no, cult, was cult. It, cult, huh? it was cult cult. That's the name of it. Yeah. OK. Yeah. It, yeah. It it was it might as well have been called election because that's primarily it might have it might have well as well been called 2016 Trump's, uh, you know, and his people are all psychotic idiots. I mean, because that's really all it's about. I mean, I, if they could have been a little bit more even-handed and, and show the fact that both sides are psychotic idiots whenever you get to the extremes of them, then I would have probably been fine with it. And if somebody comes back and tells me that that's what they did, then I'd be more than happy to go back and revisit it. But it's clearly 2016 Trump. And that's and I'm just like, I'm, I'm over this, like, saying the one side's not crazy because they are. Both sides are when you get yeah, to the extreme. Yeah, when both sides are crazy. And that would have been, you know, in my opinion, because it's not that it bothered me that it focused just on one side and it was like, oh, you're offended because you're a Trump supporter. No, it's not that. It's just that it would have been scarier if it showed the crazy of one side and the crazy of the other side. And no matter how, even if one is the opposite crazy of the other, just the fact that both of them are psychotic would make just for one reality and two, how scary shit really can get. <laughs> yeah. If they would have taken it from the point of view of somebody who's in the middle, which a lot of people are, and then they have to see how their whole reality is basically being manipulated by the extremes of both sides, which it is, then I would have been fine with it, you know, but it's, I just, I get so tired of that. It's like, well, one side's a bad guy. It's like, no, you're both bad. Like, come join us in the middle where we've yeah. got a little bit more sense. We, one side's got some good stuff. The other side's got some good stuff. You all can't get together and say anything that that's the truth. And the rest of us have to suffer because of it. But that's American politics. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, well, wait, Reverend, <laughs> hear me out for a second. Hear me out. American Horror Story, okay? Election, making fun of the right. Making fun of the left, not making fun, just showing the horror aspects. And then everyone comes to the middle and they're even fucking crazier. <laughs> that would be a good season. It's funny though. Getting, I just wrote that down. It's it, well, that'd be, that'd be pretty good actually. Uh, it, it's funny because American horror story, red tide actually goes the other way for once. And this is like the, the QAnon, like, you know, horror story. I mean, they even mentioned QAnon in the last episode, like uh, of, of hmm. at least Red Tide, because this one's split into two different sections. You got Red Tide, and then you got like wh whatever the the one with the aliens is called. But um, they this is basically the gist of this season is what if the Hollywood elites, you know, drinking blood to open up their creative energies was a real thing, and they're basically, you know. Sat satanic vampires, which they, they're not Satanists and Red Tide, but just going along with the QAnon bullshit. Uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, I mean, this kind of looks at it from that point of view. And, it, and it's interesting up to a point, And they have some really, I would say episode five, because there's six of them, is probably the pinnacle of this, this season. Because uh, the fact that they get some of the best uh, emotional work and like out of Macaulay Culkin, and uh, what is it, Sarah Polson? I think the series regular. It's been one of them yes. for years. Those two characters and their scene that they, the last scene they have together, is some of the best stuff they've done in American Horror Story, just character wise, in in years. And the fact that they got Macaulay back out there and they got him, and he, he does a great job through the whole thing. I love that part of it. And the story itself, up to that point, is both creepy. It's it's got a good flow to it. it it's it's it's. I mean, it's really well done. And then they waste every bit of that in the last episode because they take this semi-serious story investigating, you know, like creativity and like, you know, what lengths people go to to make sure that they can, you know, drug. I mean, it's kind of predicated on the idea of like using drugs to expand your creativity and that sort of thing and addiction and, and all that. And the last episode is basically just them going to Hollywood and creating like a whole mass of these like, you know, because uh, the theory in the show is if you take the pill, but you're not a creative type, it makes you into like this mindless monster who's just filled with rage and wants to attack everything because you realize your mediocrity. 
And so they go to Hollywood and like the, one of the characters is handing out pills to everybody to try to find her next big star. Cause she's a big, one of these big talent agents or whatever. And she basically fills Hollywood up with like all these raging vampires and they start destroying like Hollywood and therefore the country when they start spilling out. And it's a little bit too much of like a, you know, like a what the fuck ending for how the show started because it started with this, <laughs> you know, it starts with this family and like the dad is a creative type and the daughter's creative too and the mother might be, but you know, nobody knows. And it kind of deals with their drama and it kind of mixes in a little bit of Macaulay Culkin and Sarah Polson's interactions. And they're all personal, like smaller stories. And then you get to the ending, and it's just this big, like almost zombie like, you know, invasion or something. And it's like, uh, Murphy, Ron Murphy, okay. you just couldn't nail it. You couldn't get the ending on this one. Um, While you're upset about that, I'm over here laughing because it basically is an implication of how stupid and mindless everyone in Los Angeles and Hollywood <laughs> is. And this is coming from your resident California spirit over here. Okay. I connected that so quick and I'm like, <laughs> they really are as stupid as that. That would happen. I am telling you right now, that would be the reality of Los Angeles. If you hand those pills out, like 90% of them are going to be mindless freaks. Well, it, the only thing that I liked about the, the, the Hollywood part of it was the fact that it, it had, had a good undercurrent comment about the fact that there's all these people that are like basically working these menial, you know, like horrible low wage jobs out in California uh, low wage versus the rest of the country because you all you know, have to set, you know, wages like through the roof. But that's a whole other issue. But I mean, like these waiters and waitresses and all that, that are all writing their own screenplays all the time because that's the whole reason they came out to California was to do that too. And they never quite made it. And yeah. it's, it's the low grade anger that they suffer with every day because they have to wait on these Hollywood types that are walking in and out of their lives and reminding them constantly of the fact that they never could quite hack it, you know? And oh my God. <laughs> Uh, so there's a little bit of that and that makes sense, but I don't know. It, 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 I wasn't as disappointed with the ending as I've seen other people online because I read that it was disappointing prior to and not, not how it ended, but that it was disappointing. So I set my expectations really low and I was like, that's better than what I expected, but that's not saying a whole lot. Well, the people that are upset are those L.A. devotees <laughs> that are like, that wouldn't happen to me. I'd be like the almost awesomest creator ever, you know? <laughs> That's my opinion, um, and I'm probably right. Yeah, you probably are. Um, I would give it. <laughs> I would probably give this like a three and a half, maybe four out of five. Even probably three and a half, though. That ending kind of brought it down quite a bit. I mean, it, it's so good of a season up to that point. It's probably one of the best they've done in years, and then they just can't quite nail the ending because they went. I know what they were going for because we just discussed it, but it's it doesn't. I mean, it's a little too bombastic, a little too much versus what they set up previously. It's like a tonal shift that's just. For a very last episode, it's two out of nowhere, uh, you know, or yeah. straight out of nowhere. And it sounds like they didn't, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they didn't really hit the mark either. It sounds like a lot of people were upset about it. Yeah, it, it across the board, people were upset because they, you know, they were getting this really good family, you know, interpersonal play. And then they get this, you know, just, you know, zombie invasion of these people, you know, in California freaking out because they can't, you know, be creative. And, you know, it just, it, it didn't fit. Um Wah, wah. Wah, wah. As far as a uh, spooky season watching, uh, I, for some reason, ended up with Amanda Seyfried uh, trifecta this year. I watched Jennifer's Body prior to uh, October coming out because I love that movie. Uh, oh, I love that movie. That that low key has some of the best lore in it that that's been introduced recently in years that I'm aware of, and maybe it's based on really like you know actual lore that's like myth or whatever. But the fact they take like a, a non virgin sacrifice to Satan, and then whenever and she comes back to life is like this evil succubus. That's a neat twist. I, I think that's a cool like you know. <laughs> oh, is it now? Big shocker. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I like that the movie's got the comedy in it that it you know and it's got it's got the way that they there's some of the comedy that's a little off because uh, Diablo Cody has a has a problem of overriding her dialogue it's like you know there's one scene in particular that I find amusing but it's also cringe at the same time it's like you know at the end of the movie Jennifer gets stabbed uh, by the boyfriend or whatever right before he's he dies and 
with it, like this big spike thing. And she's sitting there and she pulls it out. And then she looks at Amanda Seyfried's character and she's like, are you plugging? You know, like, cause I, I'm, you know, cause I could really use one over here. Cause you got the blood seeping out of her. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, oh, that's kind of humorous. But at the same time, that's a little, I don't know. It's, it's a little cringe, you know, and but some of the dialogue in the movie is that way. I didn't realize though, until I rewatched it, that, uh, um, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Star Lord is in this movie. Chris Pratt is in this movie for like a hot minute. <laughs> I did not catch that. He plays Roland, I believe is the guy's name, who's the like one of the police officers that Jennifer's like sleeping with on the sly, you know, and and that's how she's got her connection oh to the police force. Uh, he's only in it for like one scene at the bar where she, he where he's kind of like hitting on her for a second. She kind of hints to him that she'll meet him in the back in the the squad car, you know to to do her thing or whatever to keep her like, you know, police connections up or whatever she does. But, uh, I just thought it was funny when he walked in there. I'm like, I did not remember you saying this. And of course, JK Simmons is Chris in it. Pratt is a whore. He slept his way to the top in Hollywood. <laughs> That's the reason we all hate him. No, so ashamed of him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> J.K. Simmons is in this, you know, uh, J. Jonah Jameson from the Spider-Man movies. He, or, you know, and then the We Are Farmers commercials. He's in a, he plays like this uh, teacher with this really bad semi-fro or whatever that is uh, kind of like a little too sensitive for the kids. He's like, kids, you need to cry it out. You know, I'm here for you. You know, he's kind of humorous in the movie. And uh, uh, one of the characters we talked about in a previous episode, um, the, uh, it was the the cleansing hour or whatever it was called with on Shutter where uh, they were uh, you had the like fake Zach Bagans like preacher or whatever that was doing the the, uh, the exorcisms like his best friend in that movie is actually the goth kid that's in this uh, which I thought oh was funny uh, but anyways I saw that and I love that movie I watch it every year so that's that's definitely one that's high rated for me I saw Red Riding Hood for the first time have you ever seen that Amanda Seyfried Red Riding Hood movie. I'm trying to think. I think I'm mixing it up with um, with Once Upon a Time because there was a red in that show, which was actually really good. But I'm trying to remember if I've seen this. No, go ahead because I, I can't recall if I have or not. It's really interesting. It, it plays into the whole theme of this episode too, the the dark fairy tale. Uh, it's it's literally Red Riding Hood, but like it's an expanded version of it. There's this town that is constantly attacked by werewolves uh, or a werewolf. And, uh, you know, Amanda Seyfried, who ends up becoming Little Red Riding Hood, basically, throughout the movie, uh, she it, it's kind of got a little bit of the Twilight stuff going on, because I think it came out around the same time. She's in love with this one guy who's like a, you know, uh, one of the village, like, laborers, and uh, kind of reminds you of, like, that Jacob character, I think his name was, from Twilight or whatever. I don't really pay attention to those movies. And anyways, she's but she's supposed to be, like, she's being set up to be married away to one of the, to the blacksmith's son, who's more of like an Edward type, you know, nobility and all that. And so she's got all that little drama going on. But then, like, they go, uh, there's, uh, her sister gets killed by the werewolf after years of having a truce with the werewolf where they would offer it up a sacrifice at night or on certain nights of the, the moon or whatever so that it would, like, eat the, the creature they were sacrificed to it and not the villagers. And so they decide that since it broke the, the trust that they would go after it. And in the process, uh, you know, they, they basically bring about the, the werewolf's, like, you know, anger or whatever. And it comes to the town. And it, it plays out basically like, a, you know, just like the fairy tale. Because she, she ends up getting like this, uh, the Red Riding Hood, you know, itself from her grandmother who's, like, made it for her and... And they, they're, it's kind of like got a little bit of the werewolves within, like who done it thing, because somebody in the town is the werewolf, but they don't know who it is. And they get Gary Oldman of all people, which was interesting to see him in it. He comes in as like this famous werewolf hunter who uh, lost his wife, who was whose wife was became a vampire, and he had to kill her. Uh, kind of a Van Helsing type. He comes in and like he he basically puts the the town on like this uh, tyrannical lockdown and, you know, trying to ferret out who it is. And he starts torturing people. And um, it's just, it, I mean, when it plays out at the end of it, it's, it's just kind of a neat twist on the, the whole red riding hood, you know, because it's not just a big bad wolf. It's actually a werewolf in this. And I would probably give it, you know, honestly, like a three and a half out of five. I mean, I, I hated the teen drama, you know, love triangle bullshit they put into it because i guess they felt like they had to copy twilight but at the same time the lore oh my that, god the lore they put into it otherwise you know some of the actors they had in amanda seafried's good in it i mean it, it it was a good a good film for what it was 
Um, yeah, she's a pretty good actress, and we're t- and she's. I mean, I sound so stupid saying this, but she was in Jennifer's Body too, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is these three films I'm discussing are all her. I did not tend that. It was just I started watching. Them, I'm like, I watched three movies with her in this. What what's wrong with me? Um, she's a horror whore. <laughs> Well, and that brings up the last movie I'm going to talk about with her. It's called uh, Things Heard and Seen. Uh, this is uh, so we've got the we've got the succubus movie, we've got the werewolf movie. Mm-hmm. This is the ghost movie. So Amanda okay. S- Amanda Seyfried is married to this uh, wasp character. You know the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, like you know up north Yankee. You know uh, Harvard elite type. You know asshole that you can think of. He goes yachting on the weekends, and he's full of his you know own bullshit about how good of a professor he is and Amanda Seyfried's married to him and you can tell their their marriage is just awful like he he's he's a son of a bitch i mean like they they just they compound throughout the movie about how bad this guy is like there's no depths that he won't sink to for anything and uh she's trying her best to raise their daughter uh the house that he's moved them into is like this old uh like almost dating back to like Salem times you know house the and they start experiencing paranormal things and what it turns out is like the previous owners of the houses, it's been like a constant cycle of the husband of the house would kill the wife and then the wife would, you know, and then like, and, and it's revealed throughout the movie that the wife is the ghost or whatever that's trying to warn Amanda Seyfried, get out while you can. Your relationships do hmm. like ours. Um, and there's not a lot of suit. I mean, there's not. There's not in, many visuals in this at all. It's like, you know, a lot of lights flickering, you know, stuff popping and stuff like that. They don't show any, like, I mean, there's a scene or two where they show, like, a semi-transparent figure, but it's not like, they don't focus on that that much. It's mostly about, it's more of a drama than anything. It's, you really see this this horrible husband devolving, like, his mental state just keeps dropping, almost like The Shining throughout the movie, because his lies just start getting compounding on top of him, and he gets getting, keeps getting caught. He, um, he's been cheating on her with a college student, probably has been for years, but he finds one local and he starts cheating on her with her like immediately right off the bat. As soon as he moves this town, he, um, he has these paintings outside of his room that were kind of his claim to fame about like he, you know, what got him into the the school that he was in and all that. Well, it turns out through that to reveal the movie and I'm going to reveal this just because the ending sucks enough to, I don't really think people should have to watch (laughs) this and I'll get into why, but like, so anyways, he, uh, so the paintings were his cousins who was kind of a, you know, kind of a, a drug addict or something like that. And it turns out that he killed his cousin while out on a boat while they were out yachting or whatever and took his paintings and took claim of them as his own. And that's what got him into art school or whatever he, what he's over now. And so, and he's lied about his, like, he forged his own acceptance letter into or his uh, own uh, recommendation letter from another professor that gets revealed later. Uh, one of the professors that he's under finds out that it was forged. And whenever he confronts him about it, he drowns him just like he did his cousin. Uh, and then of course, um, when Amanda Seyfried's just had enough of his bullshit, uh, she ends up cheating on him. But I mean, it's it at that point, you're very sympathetic to her as a character. So it, it's understandable why she would. I mean, there's nothing about this guy that's worth staying with him. And uh, she, and, like, I think the husband kind of finds out that she did, and, like, he just goes psychotic. And you, at this point in the movie, and this is why I, I, I don't know if I'd recommend it, because, and it's mainly, I guess, my expectations about what I wanted it to be. You would think if you have a ghost in there that's trying to warn her of, you know, the impending doom, that, like, she gets in a situation where the, the husband drugs her, and he, you know, he's getting ready to kill her with an axe. And, of course, he's got this bullshit reason why he's going to, you know, how he's going to get away with it. And the cops don't believe him at all. But, I mean, they don't really have any evidence otherwise. Mm -hmm. But, um, so he's getting ready to kill her with the axe. And the ghost appears, and you think for a split second that the ghost is somehow going to save her. You know, because the Chekhov's gun thing. It's like you set up a ghost, so what's the ghost going to do? It doesn't. Yeah. Like, the ghost doesn't come, because when the ghost comes out to kind of do something to the husband... There's the evil spirit of the her her own husband that's been lingering around the house, and they do hint at that. So it's there's a little bit of the evidence that that's there. He comes out at the same time, binds her, and she has to. And basically, you know, uh, Amanda Seyfried's character gets killed anyways. The only thing they kind of hint at the end of the movie to kind of give you any kind of like you know good feeling about all this is the fact that they show scenes where Amanda Seyfried has joined like the other the two other wives that were previously murdered in the house in like the afterlife and they all seem to be like, you know, peaceful. And that, you know, even though they, her daughter's still left alive without 
parents at this point. Um, like she's in the afterlife and she's, you know, uh, seems to be happy and, uh, with these two other women and, and the, 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 there was a scene toward the end of the movie where, um, the husband sees like this image that keeps being projected on a, a image at school that is t- teaching a class where this guy's sailing out into the ocean and there's an inverted cross in the sky hinting that he's sailing into hell. Well, that's how the movie. Oh shit! That's how the movie literally ends because he decides that the cops have got onto him. That is because one of the witnesses that knew that he was, you know, psychotic, wakes back up from a coma, and he knows that she's going to tell the police everything that he did or what she knows about it, and that they're going to find evidence somewhere. So he gets on the yacht and he does exactly what he did to his cousin. He basically sails out into this storm, committing suicide in a sense. And as he's sailing out into the ocean, the sky just turns like a dark red with like a fiery, you know, like symbolism. And he sees the inverted cross and it kind of hints that he has sailed. I mean, he's died at that point and he sailed directly into hell. And that's where he's going to suffer for the way he was while his wife, you know, dead though she is, is, you know, peaceful in her afterlife because she was a good person and he wasn't. Um, (laughs) It's, I don't know. I, I wanted the ending where he got caught. Like, you know, I, because he doesn't get caught, he just kills himself and he goes to hell, which, I mean, I guess that's the ultimate payback, but uh, I don't know. It felt me, I just felt like, I was like, man, I was really invested in both the, you know, just seeing him get his comeuppance and seeing Amanda Seyfried really, like, fight back against him because you feel bad throughout the entire movie that she's having to put up with this abusive asshole and then you get to that ending and you're like, no, nah, left me wanting a little bit. I don't, I didn't get what I wanted out of that. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't sound... <laughs> Doesn't sound like anything I want to spend my time watching. Uh, I mean, it was interesting for what it was, but then I was just like, yeah, if they'd done something, it would have been better. Um, and other than that, I, I've watched a few other movies. I mean, typical stuff. I watched Halloween 2 again. Uh, that's the the old version where it's like, you know, uh, actual, you know, Laurie Strode, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis in the hospital. And I'm sorry. I don't know how you feel about some of the Halloween movies. I like the first one. I like maybe the newer ones. I, there's a lot of them in between that I could give or take. Like Michael Myers was never my thing. So I don't know how you feel about him as a character. I think I like uh, the first, the fifth, and the newer ones. I want to say the fifth one was the one where the kids had the mask it, that when the song played. That was three. Three. Yeah, three. That was three. Okay, yeah. my bad. I don't know why I mixed those up. Five But was, yeah, so five. one, three, and... I think one, three, four, and the new ones are typically what most people like because four is the curse, and that introduces a, uh, uh, I don't know her, the actress's name, Danielle. Uh, that, that's her first name, at least. She's she's like the new Laurie Strode in that, and they kind of like build on the mythos a little bit. But I don't know. To me, one is you know the epitome of them. Uh, the new ones are good, and then three was good just because it's weird. You know, it's like the silver shamrock stuff, and you know the creepy little song they had, and the bugs crawling, and that was kind of a neat one. Yeah. Uh, I, that was also one of those things I watched really in the morning, early in the morning at grandma's house. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, grandma beans who rest in peace. She loved horror films. Oh my <laughs> God. That woman loved horror films. What loved watching them alone in the dark in her creepy house that everybody swears is haunted. And that woman loved horror. <laughs> That's cool to have somebody in your family like that though. Um, Oh yeah. Oh, grandma beans loved horror films. Um, I watched 28 Days Later. I, I still love that movie. Um, that's the one that it's... That's instantly becoming a classic, you know? Yeah, that that one's definitely... You can see how The Walking Dead basically stole the the first, uh, first scene, at least, where Rick wakes up in the hospital. I mean, it's outright just mm-hmm. plagiarism of that movie. Um, oh, my God. The hospital, and I loved the church scene. Oh, yeah. where that I didn't realize how... I mean, that actually was pretty tense because like rewatching it like he walks in there and like he sees the dead bodies down there and then he hears like the thumping at one end and he says hello like really stupidly and there's like that not all the bodies down there are dead so they start moving and of course the preacher comes out and like he's all psychotic and I, it's, it's a good scene um oh my god okay i have to just throw in if you had woken up like that and the town is completely like almost deserted and you're seeing all these dead people. Would you be screaming hello like he did? Uh, I mean, can you talk about a stir of echoes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, Stir of Echoes is a good movie. That reminds me, I'm going to rewatch that. <laughs> but yeah, yes, it is a good movie. Uh, I wa- Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't be doing what he did in that movie at all. Um, and in the scene, no, at- I would be like, um, I am sorry, my butt is exposed. And- if I got to run my ass, I'm not going to be screaming hello in the street. And then there's the scene. I mean, there's a lot of good scenes in that movie, but the scene at the end of it where the dad like just happens to have that bird like drop a tip of blood in his eye. And he, oh, you know, that was so good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay, and so sad. It, yeah, uh, well, the whole movie's I mean got like a lot of dark stuff in it. I mean, but it, it's it's fairly accurate as far as like its depictions of how people would be. Uh, to back right off of that one, I mean, to go right off to that, uh, I watched the new the newest I Am Legend, the one with Will Smith in it. Um, I, I got to give credit; it's better than what I remember it being. But I, I had, but I okay, but I did overlook all the scenes with the CGI. You know quote-unquote vampires because that cgi is horseshit it's it was then it is now the movie itself is good uh but the yes the, but the book it's based on is really good because it a lot of people don't realize i am legends like the third incarnation of that same story in film at least and you've got um you you've got the original movie which is last man on earth which had vincent price in it which was fairly good for its time it's black and white film uh, it, it catered a little bit more towards some of the book stuff. You got Omega Man, which had Charlton Heston. That just balls the wall, like American version of it that came out later. And it's really good for what it's got in it. Cause I watched that not too long ago. And then you got this version, which it kind of a middle ground. It's, it's got some stuff more toward the book, but then it kind of, you know, got more of the action stuff too. Um, but it's kind of interesting how it starts out though, especially post COVID and some of the stuff that's been like thrown out there about the fact that they're trying to make up a, a super virus of the measles to uh, fight cancer, and the super virus ends up being the thing that causes the vampires. Uh, you know, government agencies working together to create super bugs. Uh, that's, that's kind of a scary real-world Reverend, topic, actually. <laughs> don't tell me shit like this. Um, and then I watched The Final Girls, which I love that movie. I... I I will always recommend that as a slasher movie to anybody who just wants to watch something fun because it's such a meta movie about like slashers and the mother daughter relationship in that movie is just so good. Like Malin Ackerman and, uh, and Tysa Farmenga, like they, they knock it out of the park. Like I, I love that, that movie. Um, and it came out of nowhere and a lot of people don't know about it and I think they should. You keep bringing up campy horror and slashers. And I had a discussion with, uh, Ryan and Mike from Rain Man, and they were talking about, um, what do you call it? Fear Street. Okay. (laughs) And I gave them from what I remember and from what you and I had discussed, I had talked to them about it. And Mike at the time had not seen it. He has since seen it and he liked it. And so did Ryan. And all they focused on was the campy horror. And they're like, you just don't like campy horror films. And I'm like, okay, I do like some of them, it's not my top choice, but you're missing the entire storyline. If you're just going to say campy horror, it was great because it did focus on that a lot. But if you didn't follow the rest of the storyline from what I heard from you, from what I heard from my daughter, my husband, and from what I witnessed, it wasn't great. It, and I no. know not all campy horror films are, but they, they don't throw in bullsh- bullshit storylines. It's pretty straightforward. You're in the woods. You're going to get murdered. You try to escape. You're probably going to get murdered anyways. But, you know, sometimes things end well. Sometimes they don't. Well, it's it's funny they would make that comment because I, I would consider myself somebody that likes campy horror movies. Um, there's the the mask, the, the Rise of Leslie Vernon, uh, I believe is the, or, uh, the name of it. Or it's close enough. And that's campy horror film done in a documentary style where they're going to this Jason-like serial killer and they're documenting him you know, setting up his origin story, his like nemesis and all that. And you follow that movie. That was really well done. Uh, you got the final girls, which is super campy. I mean, you literally have the, uh, Adam Devine in that, I believe is his name who played bumper in the, uh, pitch perfect movies. I mean, just hamming it up. And I mean, campy as it can be like uh, the whole movie is, but like, it's got a heart to it and a good story. There's another one I can think of off the top of my head that I, that I enjoyed for what it was, which was um, Lumberjack Man, which is like one of the eight films to die for. It's like really cheesy because it's like, I mean, the, the killer is literally just a lumberjack that uh, like coats people in like um, red or, you know, like super boiling hot molasses or uh, 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 what is it? Uh, syrup, maple syrup. 
and uh, and like uses an axe to kill him. But like the in the movies, it's like a total joke through the whole thing. But I enjoyed it for what it was. It, Fear Street takes itself too seriously at times. You you can't have camp and but not not lean into it a little bit. I mean, you can have a little bit of the seriousness on the side, but they're the biggest issue. Like we discussed previously, is the camp was you know against going against the fact that the the main characters for at least the first part of it and then like the last third because they came back were just unbearably unlikable people you can't have that you know combination at least not to me and have it enjoyable yeah but you know um that that that's their opinion they they can have it i just don't i mean like absolutely I said, it <laughs> Yeah, I don't think they gave it the full... They're going to review it, so I don't know if they're going to watch it again and kind of have the same opinion. Um, It was... I think the impression was, oh my God, it sucks so bad, don't watch it. And that's not at all what I said. I was just like, I, for what I saw, I didn't enjoy it. And it's, I didn't even get to tell them that I hadn't watched the whole thing because they immediately went up in arms like, eh, the God, you hate campy horror. And well, I'm like, oh my God. Here's, here's my question. I wonder how much experience they have with campy horror, though. I mean, I feel like that, that, movie's, that movie would probably play well to people who don't watch a lot of campy horror movies. I mean, like... Well, and I think it's hard to say because the only campy horror they really had talked about was, you know, the mainstream campy horror when there's a lot of really good beef, well, what was used to be beef film campy horrors, they didn't throw any of those out. So, you, you, it, I don't know. I'll give them a perfect example because I watched these two uh, to round out the uh, what I've, been, I've watched so far for Spooky Season. Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. Yes. As campy yes. as you can get. I mean, they literally, Army of Darkness is basically the Three Stooges, but with a horror theme. But, I mean, yeah. they're great movies. Like, I mean, you, Ash as, as a character is an asshole, but you root for him as, an, as, as that asshole. Like, I mean, he, he's likable. Yeah. He's got the charisma to. Well, because Ash has been through some fucking <laughs> shit, though, okay? <laughs> But I mean, like you compare that character and that that type of campy horror to what you get in Fear Street, and I I don't I don't see the I don't see how they can you know view it with that kind of rose colored lenses. I really don't. Yeah, I know Mike likes Ash versus Evil Dead, so Mike might have a good opinion, and we know he watches a lot of movies. Um, Ryan, it's hard to say. <laughs> We'll just leave it at that. Do we have anything else to, sc- to discuss before I have to go? Uh, I believe that's it. So uh, we'll uh, pick this up next time with the Attack of the Bees.